In the name of God. Hello, class. My name is Mehdi Kurt Navasi, and uh, in this movie is the eighth movie of Software Architecture and Design, Chapter Three, and we will talk about the Service-Oriented Architectural Style, or SOA. Let's start. Service-Oriented Architectural, or SOA, enable application functionality to be provided as a set of services. And the certain of applications that make use of software services. Services are loosely coupled because they use a standard based interfaces that can be invoked, published, and discovered. Services in SOA are focused on providing a schema and message-based interaction with an application through interfaces that are application scoped and not component or object-based. An SOA service should not be treated as a component-based service provider. The SOA style can package business processes into interoperatable services using a range of protocols and data formats to communicate information. Client and other services can access local services running on the same tier or access remote services of connecting network. Okay, let's watch a short movie. Uh, actually, two movies, about five minutes. Innovation is defined as the process of making change in order to do something new. Service-oriented architecture makes change easier. Traditionally, building your IT meant piecing together a collection of hardware, software, and networking. These components were rigidly integrated, so implementing change was difficult. With service-oriented architecture, your IT is built with easy-to-assemble and easily reconfigurable components, like building blocks. Think of each building block not as a piece of software or hardware, but as a service your business performs, like checking someone's credit, checking inventory, or checking shipping status. Because SOA works modularly, like building blocks, you can flexibly assemble your services any way you want. When your needs change, instead of starting from scratch, you can just take apart your blocks and put them back together to make something different, saving you time and money. You can also add new blocks, even combine them with someone else's, to give your IT more muscle, to do something new, to help your business grow. Service-oriented architecture gives you the flexibility to change easily, and it's this ability to change that enables your business to innovate. Welcome to the What is Middleware series. My name is John Brunswick. We're going to discuss service-oriented architecture capabilities. In order to do this, we're going to continue to use our fictional towns, Middleware Fields and Codeaway Valley. Now, at Middleware Fields, they're a very conscious community. And because of this, they want to enable all their employees to use public transportation to get to their work to cut down on pollution. So an employee can take a bus to work, take a ferry to work, they can take the subway to work, they can even use a ride sharing service to get to work. Now, at first this was a great idea and everybody was very excited about having all of these different transportation services. But some challenges arose when people changed their last name needed to update their billing information with one of these services. 
Each one of these services stored its customer information a little bit differently. Over at the bus, they used a big mainframe computer to store all the information, and you have to telephone in to the bus company to make sure that that information is updated and accurate. For the ferry service, they actually store everything with paper files. So in order to get in touch with them, you actually need to mail them to have them update their paper files. Over time, this became really frustrating for the employees of middleware fields. They said, there has to be a better way. I can't have the knowledge of each one of these systems and how to communicate with them. It's just too complicated. So what middleware fields did, being the innovative group of people they were, they created a transit pass. Now that transit pass all of a sudden gave one single place where people could go update and change information without having to understand anything about the bus, the ferry, the rideshare, or the subway companies. In addition to that, when a new form of transportation was introduced, for instance, community bicycle transportation, or maybe they replaced the existing bus line, nothing needed to change for the employees. They could still use their transit pass and get access and work with all that information. So, what does this mean with enterprise IT? Within our companies, we have a variety of different systems. These could be ERP systems, CRM systems, financial systems, web portals, mobile portals. What we're able to do using service-oriented architecture principles and capabilities is to take those systems and create a single way to communicate across them because one system might use COBOL to communicate, another might use .NET, and another might use Java. They each have their own ways of working with code. So the problem at big companies is you need skills in every single one of these if you want to, for instance, provide self-service online for people. You need to cobble together all these existing services. So using things like a service bus, we're able to have a single place that everybody can communicate to that uses a single approach and uses a single skill set. This means that if somebody wants to change their ERP, they don't need to change all the ways in which the other systems talk to the ERP. If the web portal and the CRM system both speak to that ERP, because they do it through service-oriented architecture principles and something like a service bus, we can swap out that ERP and not have to change the existing integrations. We just need to change the one integration at the top specifically for that ERP. So this gives enterprise organizations a tremendous amount more flexibility. It allows them to have an easier time managing their systems and a lower cost of management. This allows them to respond to business needs more quickly. So as companies get more and more systems in order to reduce the complexity, service-oriented architecture principles and the technologies like a service bus that support them provide tremendous value. This has been what is middleware service-oriented architecture principles and capabilities. Okay, let's see the key principles of the FOA architectural style. The first is services are autonomous. Each service is maintained, developed, deployed, and versioned independently. Services are distributable. Services can be located anywhere on a network, locally or remotely. As long as the network supports the required communication protocols. Services are locally coupled. Each service is independent of others and can be replaced or updated without breaking applications 
that use it as long as the interface is still compatible. Services share schema and contract not class. Services share contract and schema when they communicate, not internal classes. Compatibility is based on policy. Policy in this case means definition of features such as transport, protocol, and security. Consider the SOA type if you have access to suitable services that you wish to reuse or can purchase suitable services provided by a hosting company wanted to build applications that compose a variety of services into a single UI or user interface or you are creating software plus service S plus S Software as a service, SAS, or closed applications. Service oriented architecture is a distributed model for building and managing enterprise software. Its guiding principle is that applications, when practical, should reach across the network and call upon the capabilities of discrete pieces of software known as services, rather than programmers creating those capabilities again and again for every application that needs them. Organizations determine what services they should create by analyzing their own business processes and software assets. For example, a company may have dozens of purchasing processes, each of which includes a step where an electronic purchase order is created. Instead of programming the same PO routine into each purchasing application, that capability can be built once as a service and shared, reducing effort, ensuring consistency, and providing a single point of control for changes in purchase order format or business rules. The ultimate payoff of service-oriented architecture is business agility. Developers can construct new applications to meet specific business needs quickly by drawing on services built on a variety of platforms. This loose coupling is possible because services are wrapped in standard protocols and interfaces so that a service can be invoked at runtime without specific knowledge of its platform or programming language. Services may be written from scratch, licensed from a vendor, or abstracted from existing applications, many of which run on legacy systems but, thanks to widely available development tools, typically require minimal effort to provision as services. Once services have been tested and deployed, they're published in a directory so that other developers can find them and use them in applications. Integrated with the registry is a repository that holds metadata about those services, including details about how their interfaces should be constructed, what service levels those who invoke a service should expect, who maintains the service, and so on. The most challenging aspects of service-oriented architecture are organizational and cultural. Enterprises are now struggling with such issues as what it means to own a service and how an owner should respond to requests for changes to that service from others in the organization. But many enterprises are already seeing the benefits of improved business agility, and their successes have made service-oriented architecture a dominant trend in enterprise information technology. Okay, let's see two minutes short movie about uh, services and a structure by a service provider company. The services in a service-oriented architecture are business functions that can be combined to form a complete business process. Service-oriented architecture frees these services from their legacy environment and makes them available for easy reuse by people, processes, and other applications. This reuse yields speed and adaptability for faster execution of marketing campaigns, regulatory compliance, opening up new markets, whatever organizations need to do to improve their business performance. Building services into new applications is much faster than building from scratch. It reduces costs and frees the IT department for other work. 
What's unique about TIBCO's approach to SOA is that it's platform agnostic. A service virtualization layer abstracts the complexity of heterogeneous application platforms, and TIBCO's proven bus-based architecture extends the high performance and scalability equally across the distributed enterprise. Here's how enterprise scale SOA comes together. You create services from new business logic and wrap existing legacy assets to expose them as services. Integrating legacy assets is a challenge in large enterprises. It's also something TIBCO has been doing for many years. Next, you connect the services using an enterprise service bus. Make them available for reuse by leveraging a services registry and repository and define security policies. Who can use a service and what for? Now the services can be assembled to form a complete business process. Customers, employees, trading partners, and others access these SOA-enabled processes to execute their business transactions through portals and AJAX-rich internet applications that run in a browser. Leveraging our Okay, let's see main benefits of the SOA architectural style. The first is domain alignment. Reuse of common services with a standard interfaces. Increases business and technology opportunities and reduce cost. The next benefit is abstraction. Services are autonomous and access through a formal contract, which provides loose coupling and abstraction. The next is discoverability. Services can expose descriptions that allow other applications and services to locate them and automatically determine the interface the next is interoperability. Because the protocols and data formats are based on industry standards, the provider and consumer of the service can be built and deployed on different platforms. That's a good benefit. And the next is rationalization. Services can be granular in order to provide specific functionality rather than duplicating the functionality in number of applications, which remove duplications. Service-oriented architecture to work, it's not enough to build and deploy a bunch of services. Services are meant to be shared, which means they must be created and used according to certain rules everyone can follow. Without those rules, an SOA cannot function. Collections of related rules are known as policies, and developing and managing policies is what SOA governance is all about. Policies arise from collaborative processes that affect every part of an organization that participates in an SOA. Sometimes, policy development results in soul-searching that changes how IT, or even the enterprise itself, is organized. The disruptive nature of this process reveals why governance is considered the greatest stumbling block to implementing an SOA. SOA governance policies are generally classified as design time or run time. Design time policies establish rules for developers, beginning with an interoperability framework that stipulates the protocol services use. Runtime policies lay out the details of service contracts, which include security, expected service levels, and restrictions on service use. The software most closely associated with governance is the SOA registry and repository. The registry lists services and where to find them. The repository contains pointers to the design time and runtime policy information associated with services. Typically, the registry repository also contains architectural diagrams that describe an SOA. Design time policies generally work through incentives. Developers are rewarded for building services the correct way and penalized for building them the wrong way, or for writing applications that could use services that don't. 
Runtime policies, however, can often be enforced by a service management system that simply disallows improper use. Every service has an owner, frequently the same person or group who developed the service's business rules. Vague definitions of what ownership entails invite conflict. For example, the owner of a service may have one idea of a service's scope, while another entity in an organization demands more functionality. Organizations need to determine how to resolve such disputes, and when service requirements increase, where to obtain the resources to build out. Rules are rules, but the key to SOA governance is collaboration. Governance policies need to be developed, maintained, and modified by committee rather than decree. People who know what's happening on the ground must have real input. Managers need to ensure policy updates are properly distributed, soliciting feedback along the way. With the right culture and processes, governance can ensure a successful SOA. Okay, we reach to the end of this chapter, and thank you for watching this movie.